you know, I think the most psychologists would probably analyze Paul as having terrible self-esteem. And they'd, they'd probably be right in some regard. I know that's a psychological uh, term, self-esteem, or self-image, but that is what Paul had when he said, wretched man that I am. He, he, when Paul was faced with Paul, when Paul was introduced to Paul, Paul didn't like what he saw. That's what we find in Romans 7. And there are, a lot of people have concluded that the, these confessions of Romans 7 were bef, was before he'd come to Christ and were born again. But no, it, they're present tense. He said, when I, when I will to do good, I find evil is present with me. It's present tense yeah. verbs. He said, wretched man that I am, not was. It's true that he was wretched man as well. Uh-huh. So all of us can, can claim that past tense and present tense. But he did use it present tense, wretched man that I am. Now, thankfully, because of the gospel, that's, there's more that can be said. That wasn't the end. See, Romans 8 followed Romans 7, so that wasn't the end of the story, but it is a a present tense confession, wretched man that I I am. You know, this is the only one of two, one of only two places in the scripture that the word wretched is used, at least in the King James. The wretch isn't actually found in some of our hymns, of course, but wretched, the only other place it's used is... In Revelation 3, when Jesus was diagnosing Laodicea, you're wretched. Now, here, here's, a, here's another handle for you to put on the word wretched. It means miserable. That doesn't make it much better, does it? No. Miserable man, I am. Of course, that's a good Bible word, too. If, it, if we have hope only in this world, you're of all men most miserable or wretched. So Paul did suffer from a bad self-image, but I suggest to you that that's why he had so much grace. Because when he looked into, as James put it, when he looked into the perfect law of liberty, then he agreed with what he saw. And, you know, there's talk in a lot of churches today about uh, self-esteem and loving yourself and forgiving yourself, and the Holy Spirit doesn't talk like that, and those words have no place in the church. Wretched man that I am, I can agree with that. Don't talk about, don't, the, the church doesn't need the, the tools of the psychologist. The church has already been diagnosed. Yeah. And that's one reason why we have this Romans chapter 7. Mm-hmm. And so I'd say, uh, if, if Paul, when he looked into the perfect law of liberty, or inward, that's another way, another way of saying that, because the, the law is like a reflection. So when Paul looked inward, if he said, wretched man that I am, then I, I think Aaron should. Yeah. And I suggest that you, you, you should have the same self-image. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's um, well, there's more to be said than, than that. I, I appreciate Brother Tony's uh, frank. He's, he's always very frank with us. I never, yeah. I never feel like Brother Tony's holding back, you know, with how he, he, just, he just says it like he, like he wants to say it. But Jesus told men exactly what it would take. And people need to hear exactly what it'll take today. You know, people, the, uh, there's, there's a message going out from the church today that isn't, isn't accurate. It's not telling men exactly what it'll take about denying yourself and losing your life and hating your life. There's a different message uh, going out. But my job today is the exhortation. Um, I like to think of the exhortation as uh, putting an encouraging Uh, tag on the end of the message tag it with an encouraging uh, instruction so here here's what I uh, have for you today Peter Peter was faced with himself that night when Jesus after the three denials that that he that Jesus told he would do after that third one Jesus uh, turned and looked at him and you remember Peter's response he he wept he realized Jesus knew what was in Peter, but Peter didn't yet know what was in Peter. And that look, remember this is in the Revelation, John would see that, that, that Jesus had eyes like a flame of fire. And don't you think Peter could have said that that night? That's right, that's right. That look, after the third denial, Peter probably would have said, that was like 
that was like eyes of, like a flame of fire. He just, Jesus saw him. He knew what was in him before Peter knew what was in him. Well, I, I exhort you that Jesus knows what is in us. And this is what conviction is all about. It's, us, it's, it's Aaron coming up to speed with what's in Aaron. That's what conviction is. And when I see it, as it really is, then I'm able to own Paul's confession here, wretched man that I am. And when I'm a wretched man, then I'm a, I'm a candidate for grace then. That's who, that's who grace is targeted for. for uh, David uh, was a regular confessor of sins. And I, I appreciated uh, Brother Given's comment this morning that so many of the Psalms teach, teach us how to confess sin. That, would, that really put a handle on it for me. I, I was, I'm grateful for that. Uh, David, he led the pack in con- confessing sin because David saw, he saw himself. So the, uh, the good fight of faith is primarily fighting against the wretchedness that's in you. Think about it this way. I can't get away from my flesh. And you understand when we say flesh, we're not talking about flesh and bones. We're talking about Adam's nature. That's, right. that's, that's how the Spirit has represented the fallen part of man. So I'm not, when we say flesh, it's not, it's not my body. That's, that, that may be part of it. But primarily, we're talking about the sinful nature that is still in us. And that's what Paul was talking about when he said, wretched man that I am. So the good fight of faith is primarily against the fleshly nature. I can, the prayer closet isolates me for the most part from the world, right? And so I don't see what I would see otherwise, and I don't hear what I would hear otherwise. And so Jesus talked to, this is wise uh, practice, go into the prayer closet and you exempt yourself from some, some of the weights and distractions and little foxes. But I can't, I can't get in a closet away from my flesh. My flesh goes in with me. And, and here's another aspect of this, that the, that the good fight of faith is primarily against the flesh. If I resist the devil, he'll what? Flee. But if I resist the flesh, he doesn't flee. He's still there. So the good fight of faith is primarily, and I understand we wrestle against the devil as well, and we fight against the world as well. But when you get really down to the brass tacks, we're... The, the good fight of faith is primarily made up of flesh, the wretched part of me that has been, it's been uh, circumcised, it's been, uh, it's been buried with Christ, but I'm not, we're not completely done with it yet. Right. Just like the Canaanites were still in Canaan, yeah, right. and they were there to prove the Israelites. Yeah. So, um, so the issue then is after I've, after Aaron's been introduced to Aaron and after Aaron is learning to wrestle against the wretched part of Aaron, the, the issue now is that I discern between the old and the new. So there's the caveat of the exhortation is have your senses exercised. This is Hebrews chapter five. Uh, the, the meat of the word will exercise your, your senses, your discernment to discern between good and evil. And that's not discerning whether you should lie or not. That's not what, the, that's not what that discernment's about. Discerning between good, good and evil is discerning what, what presents itself as good, but inside it's evil. It's, it's discerning, uh, sensing the nature of something, not, not in, in spite of the appearance of something. And that's what... That's what is required for the good fight of faith. But the, the most dangerous enemy is the enemy that you can't sense. You can't see, you can't hear. You can't, you can't, if you can't sense it, if you can't discern it and find it, then it's the most, it's the most deadly. And so I exhort you to uh, constant use. That's the phrase in Hebrews chapter 5, talking about the word, the meat of the word. By constant use, have your senses exercised to discern between good and evil. And uh, that's, that gives you the advantage in the good fight of faith. It's a necessary advantage. Amen. So thank you for your message, Brother Tony. Amen. We open up.